The Shroud of Turin is the gift that just keeps on giving. I'll be right back. Hey there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike Creevy from TheGraciousGuest.org here with you today, and I'm really excited, uh, as usual, to be here with you. Uh, this is the place where we kind of crack open all things wonder and awe and uh, try to sort of rise up a little bit out of the, the humdrum, the mundane, the stuff that tends to get us uh, kind of just the, you know... Um, the, the 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 grind right the daily grind the hamster wheel and all that and every now and then we just sort of press pause and we take a step back and we say wow <laughs> you know um and that that can be uh something that i experienced through uh, just a uh, cracking open lord of the rings again you know uh, or or going outside taking the dog out at night and looking up at the stars you know doing the same thing early in the morning you know um whatever it might be you know these these experiences these intersections in our life with uh, moments that clearly the Lord is, I think, trying to uh, put in our way to just raise us up a little bit, you know, and we tend to just look down, you know. He wants to raise us up and get us to look. So before we go any further, though, please make sure you like this content. Subscribe if you haven't done already on the YouTube channel. Uh, you know, hit the little thumbs up there. It only takes a second to do that. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, also, I would ask you to please uh, leave us a good review over there at uh, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, all, uh, basically anywhere, Spotify, anywhere you can get podcasts, you can get The Gracious Guest Show. Um, and actually, I've been doing the podcast version for longer than the uh, YouTube version, so uh, trying to make sure that I reach... Uh, you know, sort of both sides of the coin here. So if you're listening, thank you so much for being a faithful, gracious guest fan. I call you guys the gracious gang. So uh, uh, so whether you're listening on the audio version or the video version, either way, uh, we're happy to have you here. Uh, so I want to jump right in t- today to the interview that uh, I just finished. It's just so exciting. I, I, I loved it. And it was with Dr. Cheryl White. And uh, uh, Dr. White is, is well known sort of in the Shroud community. And, and I want to read you here her, her little uh, brief CV just to kind of give you an idea where she's coming from. So Dr. Cheryl White, PhD, she's a professor of history at Louisiana State University in Shreveport, where she holds the endowed Hubert Humphreys professorship. She has a, had a career and in, uh, interest in Shroud studies, currently serves on the board of directors of the Shroud of Turin Education and Research Association, or STERA. By the way, that's, uh, if you go to, you know, www.shroud.org, which I typically link down in the show notes for any time we explore the Shroud of Turin, um, that is uh, where you can get a lot of, of the Shroud of Turin Education Research Association's stuff, of course, on, on there. So, She has published and presented original research from the Vatican secret archives related to the history of the Shroud for international journals and conferences. Dr. White served as the historical consultant on the Shroud of Turin exhibit developed for the Museum of the Bible, which we've spoken about here on this program in uh, Washington, D.C., And with Father Mangum, who's another uh, Shroud uh, researcher and, and presenter, she has given presentations there at the Museum of the Bible, as well as provided an internationally live-streamed presentation for the esteemed Smithsonian last year. She also was able to see the Shroud recently as part of a private event in Turin at the invitation of the Center for the International Study of the Shroud. So without further ado, I'm going to quit yapping and get you right over here to the, the good stuff. My interview with Dr. Cheryl White, who was very gracious to come on The Gracious Guest Show. Check it out. All right. Hey, Dr. Cheryl White, thank you so much for coming on the Gracious Guest Show today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, and it's I started to say to you before we were recording, and I've, I've mentioned this a few times, that uh, you know the, the hand of providence in all of this, for me, having anything to do with seemingly more, more routine Shroud-related interviews on my YouTube channel and for the podcast, I never you know really saw it coming, didn't set out uh, to highlight this this particular topic. You know, in particular, I mean, I do other stuff on my channel for, for my high school uh, theology class and just some other theological topics and literature and stuff like that that I'm interested in. But this just keeps popping up, you know, and this and God keeps you know putting people in my path. So I wanted to ask you in sort of maybe a similar vein, if you just want to uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, your own background, your own exposure to the shroud, sure. kind of when that first got on your radar. Sure. I, I can remember exactly. It was... Um... 
the early 1980s when the very first the very first peer reviewed let me close out something real quick uh, the very first peer reviewed articles began to be published from the 1978 Shroud of Turin research project that all of that began coming out in the early 1980s and I was an undergraduate history major at the time and I remember being really fascinated by um, by the by the science, by the inexplicability of all of it. And that really hooked me. But then in 1988, I was a graduate student in history. I was working on, uh, not was not in a PhD program yet, but I was in a, a master's program and the carbon 14 dating results came out. And so right. like many, like many people, I took a step back and, uh, and thought, well, you know, it, it's an interesting artwork. Right. Um, and, but it never it never turned me loose, and so uh, I have spent probably all the time since engaged in some kind of research on this cloth, speaking about it, teaching about it, and of course now, as you know, you, you mentioned before we started recording, you mentioned that that um, you'd had Joe Marino on talking about the mm -hmm. dating. We are now confronted with the very real possibility again that we're talking about a first century cloth, mm -hmm. and I think that's generated more excitement in this cloth than there has been in the last 30 years for sure. Right. Hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I've, yeah. it's never turned me loose. It's always right. been, yeah. Okay. Well, and that's, it's interesting because, so you're uh, in, in terms of your own academic uh, studies and, and I, I had, you know, in the, the portion people have seen or heard by this point at the beginning, just the, the, the basic uh, synopsis right. of, kind of your background, but, but right. what, um, is there anything in particular about the, the shroud that that really kind of caught your attention or, or, or stuck with you kind of, I, I guess, academically, for lack of a better term, maybe? Yeah. Um, in terms of, of your own sort of, you know, research, because I know this isn't, of course, the only thing that interests you, of course, but, you know, it's I'm, I'm just curious how that kind of has tied into your own historical interests. Well, I've always um, I've always had an interest in relics and the cult of relics, particularly cults of devotion in the Middle Ages. I was always interested in kind of medieval piety. Um, and so uh, it kind of was a natural fit for what I was already interested in academically. But then there was this other uh, dimension of it for me, uh, philosophically, to know that it is the most studied object in the world and we, and we still don't understand it. And I don't know of any man-made object we can say that about. And so mm. um, it, it's, it's, it's been a philosophical challenge for me. Uh, and... and um, um, I think my interest in art, my interest in relics, my interest in the in the Christian piety of the of of well across the centuries, um, sure. really drew me in and continues continues to hold my interest. But this is unlike any other relic. You know, right. it's just so unusual that I think we all have to stop and give it serious consideration. Sure. Well, and and maybe to that point, maybe we could kind of dive in here to some of the, sure. maybe some of the things in particular that, that really strike you just in terms of like the, you know, and I, I try to phrase it this way when I'm talking to people about it who might not know really anything about it, is I try to point out like this, as I've been discovering more and more, and I'm still very much, you know, amateurish about this, I feel like, you know, but the, the, the facts of just the cloth, like this isn't, there's so much that's not sort of a debate. It's like these, these are factual realities right. you know, scientifically verified about this cloth that bear <laughs> some some pondering so i'm, I'm curious what, what are yeah. some of the, the biggest so, ones in your view well so to begin with i think it's the fact that that this cloth bears the the inexplicable image um of a man a forensically accurate by the way forensically accurate anatomically perfect image of a real human being this is not an artwork. I mean, it's not a painting. It's not a photograph. Um, this was a real human being, and um, it, it it is an image that um, of a man who was scourged and crucified in Roman fashion, who was capped with something thorny on his head and was pierced in the right side between the fifth and sixth ribs. And if it is an artwork or an icon, it's a perfect one, number one. And it also um, cannot represent any other person of history. I mean, it's not like... It's not like we're not intended to know who this person is that's that's represented okay. here. And there there is that that we can't explain the image number one. There's the fact 
that I think we don't talk enough about is the fact that the blood was present before the image. Um, we know that the, that the blood was present on the top fibrils of the linen before the image was, uh, which tells me that, that artistically that's counterintuitive. If you're going to create an artwork, you're not going to create, you're not going to put the blood stains and then, and then create the wounds. Um, mm. So, so there, there was that image, that part of it that always interested me uh, about the image. There's obviously the overwhelming evidence we have about the soil, about the pollens that are on the cloth. Right. Um, that gives us an environmental journey. So, so we know where the cloth has been in its history. We know, we know it's been in Jerusalem. Um, sure. That's, that's CSI 101, you know, to right. us today. So, so I have to, as a medievalist, a uh, medieval historian uh, it, it, by, by trade, I think my biggest question came when, um, when I was in that period of, of trying to discern, okay, is it an artwork of a really clever artist? And we, we just, somebody who had advanced knowledge of human anatomy and botany and blood spatter forensics and all of this uh, 700 years before we knew anything about it. There was that part of me that, that knows that in the middle ages, when you have this cult of relics that is so, so popular uh, to the, at the social local level, that if you could take a bone of, of a cow, let's say you picked up the femur of a cow in, in a field somewhere, you could pass it off as the bone of a saint and nobody would know the difference. So why, why would that era produce something this sophisticated? An image that you couldn't even see because we didn't have the technology yet to see right. what we now know. So, but the medieval pilgrim believed it. And they didn't, they didn't see the photographic positive negative image that we see. So I think that that, you know, all of these things together, once you begin to consider each individual level of, of incredulity, mm -hmm. it's like, it just all adds up. I mean, there's, there's so much in the cloth that, um, that defies the, the, the explanation that it is a medieval creation. I know of no process. I know of no process that would have created it. And it's just far too complex. It's too sophisticated. Well, and that's, see, I, and, and I'm just, I'm looking here quick because I have, I don't know if I can find it because I think <laughs> I, so there were some comments I got before. Good. You know, that are, that are interesting from the standpoint of, um, for some reason it's hiding on me now here, but, um, you know, uh, I can basically paraphrase it. You know, I, I had uh, the last time I posted something on the shroud. You know, there, and, and I see this almost, almost every time. You know, most of the comments you get are, you know, just a thank you or hey, that was interesting. And 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 honestly, I don't read them very very often. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, sometimes I don't even allow them just because it's I don't I don't have time to respond even if I wanted to. Quite frankly, so it's not a you know. Uh, if I don't have comments on or don't at some point for this video, please don't anyone be offended or think that I'm like scared. <laughs> I just, I don't, I don't have that kind of time. Right. Um, but there was, there was one a couple times ago that kind of caught my eye where, you know, it was, it was just interesting. It was an interesting approach. It basically, if, if, if I, just to be blunt, it sort of kind of ignored all of the, the, the evidence that had been suggested by my guest in, in you know, I, I don't remember exactly which video it was, even off the top of my head, and then just just sort of declared and just stated it's a it's a 13th century or 14th yeah. century hoax, and blah blah blah. You know, Leonardo claimed he did. Like it's it's just you, you'll get things like that, and, and they're usually long comments. Someone type, spends a, a while right. typing it up, and I find it interesting. Because, and I just want to kind of turn this back to you, as far as you know, when someone says you you know, there's no evidence, no evidence, no evidence. It makes me wonder very often what they think the word evidence means, you know, and, and I maybe, <laughs> yo, throw it's that, true. Throw that to you in that sense. Yeah. No, it's true. And, and I have, I give talks on the shroud and have for many, many years all over the world. And so I have encountered almost every kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always stumped by people who in the face of overwhelming scientific information, um, that was obtained with scientific rigor mm -hmm. um, 
by many, well, uh, many, largely by a, a lot of people who did not have any kind of Christian bias whatsoever. Right. <laughs> or, well, or, ex you know, yeah. exactly. That that they will seize on to the one piece of information we have that points to a medieval dating of 1260 to 1390 mm -hmm. from one test done in 1988 that we now know, of course, a lot about the protocol being violated for that. Mm -hmm. And they will take that one test and throw out all of this other information that was obtained with equal scientific rigor. And I have to tell you, I don't understand that approach to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I, therefore, I don't know how to answer it. It's, it's the one thing that stumps me every time. It's, it's a completely, for someone who frames themselves as responding scientifically, yeah. to reject all of this information that was obtained scientifically is baffling to me. It's... Mm -hmm. It's it, it's it, it's actually counter to logic, and sure. um, and so I, I don't I don't ever know how to deal with those people, <laughs> except to say except to encourage people to to really study it. If if yeah. if you have enough interest in it that you've already declared it to be some kind of a medieval forgery, right. then you have not you have not studied it. You have not studied it, and. Yeah. And I, and I also think that there's a problem that we sometimes run into. And this is a, a, something Russ Briault, my for instance, have talked about this many times. Sure. Uh, you mentioned he'd been your guest, and he and yeah, I are good yeah. friends. He, he and I are good friends, and so I can say this. But one of the things that we go back and forth about is this is this idea of proof. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure that as an academic I do anybody any favors by suggesting I can prove that the shroud is authentic. And I'll tell you why, because right. if it is the authentic burial cloth of Christ, um, then what we're dealing with is, is something that is a supernatural event. Right. And I think we are therefore asking science to do something that science cannot do, which is to sure. extend into the supernatural realm. Science is natural. It is a natural process. It's a natural right. way of knowing. And so, I'm always a little stumped by by how to again. When Russ and I've talked about this. He says, "Oh, it's you know proof of the resurrection." Well, the resurrection was a supernatural event, mm -hmm. and um, we have scientific evidence that points to something we do not understand. That's the way I'd like to deal with it. You know. Well, and there you know there are people who saw the risen Christ with their own eyes who didn't right. believe it. So, so there right. is something, and it was interesting because a colleague, you know, theology colleague of mine just today, you know, we were, we were, um, we had a, a seminar and we were looking over some of, uh, the Magis Center's stuff, you know, and, and yes. Father Spitzer and, and, uh, who I also a friend. Dearly. Yes. Yeah. And yes. I, I love him dearly. And, and, but yeah. we were talking about this very thing of like, where, you know, just to be careful with like, how do we talk about this where, you know, when we talk about proof and just, you know, like yes. if, if, if a person you're talking to thinks that what you're saying by proof is not so much the Aquinas proof kind of notion of, of, of in terms of this is a rational line of reasoning. Right. But there is a limit to it because then eventually we're, we're going to have to make this step in, in, in faith. I think yes. we would want to say to the, to any listeners and viewers, we're, you know, we're never suggesting here that whenever we talk about the shroud, even if we could prove definitively historically that it is indeed the real deal and it's Jesus's burial cloth. It's not like we we're saying for a second that that somehow takes out the nece the necessary nature in our salvation of making a, a sure. faith decision, you know, to to accept yeah. and, and repent of our sins. And you know, of course, it's it's not just an intellectual endeavor. No, it it is not. And here's and here's the thing: when I was speaking about a philosophical challenge, I think you've just touched on it. It is the fact that that we reach a limit of our human knowledge. We confront the limits of our human knowledge and realize that there is only so far that we can reason, and um, we we don't understand the infinite mysteries. And and I don't think we're supposed to. And so. Um, what I like to think of uh, when I speak of the Shroud to people, particularly inquirers who are just curious about it, is to lead them into it because once they're in the mystery, they're already there. I mean, mm -hmm. it's I don't feel like I have to prove anything. Um, the, the image speaks for itself, you know, and right. and um, it, it, it. But I always, of course, am left with the with this um, aspect, too is that if I have a cloth that bears an image of a man who's been scourged and crucified in Roman fashion and, um, 
and and I, I I can see the intricacies of every single wound on his body, and it aligns with the gospel accounts. As a matter of fact, it's a perfect mirror of the gospel accounts. Right. And I cannot like not, recreate not one, de- not one detail is not you know, it, not <laughs> one, not a right. single one, and and that alone and, is an enormous achievement. <laughs> And the uh, and I don't know who did this calculation, but you may may look into this. Someone calculated the odds of this being anybody else in history, and it's mm. just billions and billions to one. And mm-hmm. and the um, when you're confronted with that that reality, and then you and then you confront the reality that we cannot recreate this in 2022 with every piece of sophisticated technology and advanced right. science that we have then we've got a real philosophical issue with suggesting that somebody in 1260 knew how to make this. Right. And see, that's the thing that kind of drives me crazy sometimes when, and I think Dr. Uh, John Jackson has pointed this out. I think several have pointed out that, you know, you have skeptics or naysayers or, you know, and again, I'm not, if if you're skeptical, great, like have at it. Absolutely. You know, go to work. Skepticism is where, was where knowledge begins. Right. And and you can't, but, but, Every like to a person, every time I've ever seen someone supposedly debunk it, they're taking a look, they're making an argument for, they're making their case for debunking the blood or right. debunking the linen itself or debunking the image or debunking the, the pollen. No one, I've never seen anyone even attempt to debunk more than two or three things at once. And then John Jackson's made the point you got to debunk it all, or you, know, or you have to be able to duplicate all of it you have you know the the the, the you know the, the cloth like the weaving the radiological uh, nature of the image itself the the blood stains right. the, the the how it matches perfectly with the sidarium I mean, it's it's just the list is just astonishing it really it really is astonishing and and i also think that the um um the the issue with with the image itself you know uh, the complexity of that image nobody I have ever spoken to has been able to explain that. And, Mm -hmm. and, and if you're going to say that, you know, a process by which you can do this, I am ready to see it Mm -hmm. because to date, no one has matched all 17 image characteristics that have to be met. You know, six of them are related to the person and 11 related to the cloth itself. Um, Nobody's been able to do that. And so why, Why then can we not in 2022? Why can we not do that? We know that we know the depth of the image. We know its radiographic properties, as you mentioned. We know uh, what it's made of. It's a saccharide. It's sugar. It's a sugar. Mm. Um, There's there's a chemical process that took place in the cloth itself that um, um, triggered by the the energy burst or whatever. Triggered by whatever the whatever the energy was that was that that brought this image into being created an image that is in in effect very superficial on the cloth i could scrape it off with a razor blade right but yet it contain, contains so much complex information yeah. that is mind-boggling and nobody nobody that's ever i've ever spoken to has been able to suggest they know a way to do that hmm. not the most sophisticated minds in our world today right. so so yeah i'm always a little sus- suspicious of the armchair expert who says, oh, no, it's a 13th century fake. Okay. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's not fake. It's a real image. <laughs> and, and to me, I, I'm sorry, but some, sometimes, and I'm not saying this for, again, I'm not saying this for everybody who's skeptical. I'm saying this for that particular you know, kind of, of attitude and approach that's just instantly dismissive without really a good argument. You know. Well, uh, I and, also and it, think... It, remi- it reminds me of the people that will just say, everybody knows we didn't really land on the moon. It was just, you know, and they'll just say it and then move on. And it's like... right. You can't, you can't do, that's just dishonest or that's just intellectually no, responsible. It's, it's, it's intellectually know, it's dishonest. That's, that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it is. It's, it's, it's intellectually yeah. dishonest is what it is. And it's, it's not doing, it's not doing the work to, no. to really discern or to, right. to discriminate between what is good evidence and what is bad evidence. Um, well, it, it, honestly, I feel like it cuts all the fun out too, quite frankly, of, of the adventure of, of exploring <laughs> yeah. something like this. And you just, right. you just dismiss it with that kind of attitude that that always bears like a sort of, quite frankly, at least the, the comments I've seen, it always has at least a little twinge of arrogance in there. You know what I mean? Like, or there's just this, you can feel this sense of like, I know the real deal and you're just being silly. And there I put this out on YouTube for everybody to see. 
this this comment I wrote, and it's just I just wonder why people do that. <laughs> okay, so that's a great question too, and I was just you know, what's the point? <laughs> I was going to flip this back on my host and ask mm. you. I mean, can we can we name what that is? I mean, hmm. I have an idea. You know, I I feel like it's informed by. I actually believe it's informed by someone who is genuinely seeking. Mm -hmm. And, and what I hear in that is a kind of a plea. Um, it's, it's not so much a dismissal to me mm. as it is, um, perhaps not, not confronting the deepest questions that person might have, you know, I think that's fair enough, you know, and that's, yeah. I think it might even be tied to the same, you know, like I see this sometimes with high school students in a little different way where, you know, some of the you know, like we might have a particular text or a particular, you know, video or some, something where we're approaching some sort of church teaching. And it's just at least their interpretation of it is it's, it's just it's just fluff or it's not sufficient or it's not like it doesn't right. address their pain and right. their, you know, look like I've seen some terrible things or this is just, you know, and this isn't doing it for me. And here you are, you're all happy and you think this means something, but it, it doesn't mean something to me and I'm not convinced. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's an important yeah. thing to recognize. You yeah. know, like that, and that's why, like, I don't, I don't get into it one way or the other, because to me, it's not about, I'm not, I, I wouldn't say I'm so much positively making it my mission in life to like prove to other people that the Shroud of Turin is Jesus' burial cloth. I, I'm trying to, um, in my own little way, bring Christ to people <laughs> and, to, mm -hmm. and to the extent that I'm increasingly convinced that this is, you know, part of what Christ is doing. You know, that's, that's why I'm doing this, you know, but I'm well, not yeah. and trying here's to win, the, win an argument, so to speak. And I, I would say that you and I have a similar approach there because I think, as I, as I think I've articulated that this, this artifact is compelling enough to, to have merited, you know, 30 years of my life studying it. And, and I still don't have the answers. And so, so being intellectually honest, I have to confront the reality that there's something I don't know. And um, no matter what you think about this cloth, no matter what you think about it, we can't answer its greatest mystery, which is how the image was formed. <laughs> and so that greatest mystery is what people either have to be willing to step into or not. And right. when we are when we are called into mystery, we are already in the in the presence of something greater than ourselves. Right. And, and sometimes that's just how far you can go. I think it's Bishop Barron has pointed out, I think a few times, I think the, the etymology of Mysterion, I think in, in Greek has something to do with to shut the mouth, you yeah. know, which yeah. is this idea of like, you just, you encounter this thing and it's just, I don't, you know, any, exactly. anything that I can make my mouth do right now doesn't yeah. add to this, doesn't actually explain it. It's, this is it. This is the thing, you right. know? And I feel right. like that's probably why, you know, like Thomas, of course, you know, the famously, you know, he, he wants proof, you know, Thomas yes. the skeptic. Yes. And when, right. when he's finally confronted, I love it. You know, that Jesus, I feel like there's this, this little, um, maybe a little hint in there too. Like if, if this is the authentic shroud of Christ, why would he give this to the world? It's like, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't say no to Thomas touching his wounds and having this yeah. evidence, but, but Thomas didn't need it. You know, and he, he declares that 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 faith in Christ. That's an internal assent, you know, to this this mystery. Well, look, and there's there's you know, there's no doubt that our human nature. I mean, we have we have more than one epistemology. We have one way of coming to know anything. I mean, um, there it's absolutely nothing wrong with needing to touch or see with our senses, or you know, experience with our senses is is a valid way of knowing. And it's, it, it might not be, I'm going to channel Plato here. It might not be perfect, but, but it, it is a valid way. And um, however we reach the truth, um, whether it's through our, our senses or through some extrasensory or multisensory or um, metasensory experience, you know, why does that matter? I mean, I guess, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, the question is, if you can't answer, if you can't answer what this is, then there's something about our human capacity that is being challenged. Mm -hmm. 
following that will ultimately lead people to something greater than themselves. And I think that may be sure. part of the, that's part of the hesitation. You know, I have had, I have a very good colleague, a very good friend who, um, who is an atheist and has said to me, and he, he's followed and supported my work in this. Mm -hmm. And, um, as a historian and, and, and he has said to me, you know, um, when you're an atheist, it makes it very uncomfortable to have to consider um, a, a narrative other than what you what you think is true. Sure. And so, yeah, I do think that that's some of the resistance you encounter from people, mm. you know, for sure. But yeah. um, and, you know, the historical gaps, the historical gaps don't help the case. Um, right. If you wanted to if you wanted to trace it back to the time of Christ, I think that sure. we can. But we're limited in our vocabulary and we're limited in the right. historical uh, record. So, well, and I do, and I want to get to actually, I have a couple questions about that. In a second. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on, on what you just said. In sure. Terms of, um, sure. Sure. I th and I think uh, Russ or Guy or I think maybe, maybe you know, a couple people I've had on have, have pointed something similar out here that, you know, if, you know, if, if we find out absolutely definitively, you know, tomorrow that it's, that it's a hoax, you know, and I would have to, you know, accept that and move on. That's not what my faith completely rests on. Right. But I feel, and I think that that's the case really for, for any believer looking into this, but I, I think it's to be fair for those who are agnostic or atheist or, or, or even of another faith tradition, you know, looking at this perhaps, and I, I don't know that I can adequately really, I, I'm sure I can't adequately understand exactly what that feels like when you're talking about okay if this thing is real and right. then as a next step if if it actually does lend credence to the truth of of the christian faith and all these other things come with it i feel like you, you have a lot more potentially that you would have to consider changing than yeah. me if it turns right. out to not be true so I, I i want to appreciate that too that for those who are skeptical sure I, you know I, sure. I don't think i don't think we're all in exactly I, well, it's not, I was going to say fair fight. That's not the way to put it. But like, I feel like, we're, we're, you know, depending on where you're at in the, sort of that spectrum, that that's got to sort of shape this a lot differently for people. Right. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. Yes. But but with, yes. with the, the history, like you mentioned the gaps, and I wanted to just kind of go through that a little bit. And I had, I, I told you, you know, uh, uh, Guy Powell, who, of course, you know yes. as well, um, um going through this, you know, which, which of course, and for, for um, uh, listeners who haven't, or viewers also who haven't seen or heard that podcast with Guy, you can go back in, in uh, my channel and find that one where he discusses his, his historical fiction novel that sort of tries to fill in some of those gaps based on a lot of those threads there. But I, I want to ask you maybe just some of the highlights as far as what seems to be, you know, some of the best evidence or best potential explanations of how it gets from Jerusalem, you know, on, mm -hmm. on Easter Sunday to, to, you know, uh, Turin. Mm -hmm. And of course, after, like, we know where it's been since it's been there. Um, right. And of course, we, before we, that, going back to, to France for a while, of course, but. Yeah. We, I mean, we know for certain where it's been since the middle of the 14th century. So right. that, that is not in question at all. Right. Um, I, I believe, you know, if, you, if we, if we backtrack a little bit, I believe mm -hmm. that there's about 141 years we cannot account for. I think it okay. was in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. It was there in 1204 when the city was sacked during the Fourth Crusade and it left. Um, um, I've actually spent some time looking at that particular period, uh, the, the letters and papers of Pope Innocent III um, in the Vatican Secret Archives. Mm -hmm. To try to to try to piece some of that together, I I think I believe that Pope Innocent III knew the cloth was there. Actually, that he that he makes a direct reference to it in a letter. Um, he does still not in Constantinople. Yes, that, okay. yes, he does not list it when he is when he is railing against those who have stolen relics and looted churches. He does not list it, but in an, in a separate mm -hmm. letter, which is more homiletic in nature, he makes what seems to me to be a direct reference to knowing that it was in Constantinople. And mm -hmm. so I think we can place it there based on that and other evidence. You know, we have the uh, the account of Robert de Clary, who was the knight on the Fourth Crusade, who, who wrote the conquest of mm -hmm. Constantinople and describes an image of our Lord at full length. It was displayed every Friday at the Church of St. Mary de Blacarnie. Well, what is he talking about? I mean, right. um, 
there is there's that evidence. There's the imperial relic inventory we have from 1201 that places it in the in the emperor's relics in Constantinople. We have the record. We have the record from 944 when it was received in Constantinople. Um, but but here's the problem. Was that potentially when it came up from was it Edessa? From Edessa. Okay. From Edessa. Well, here's the problem though because. Oh. Once it goes to Turin in 1578, well, we call it the Shroud of Turin, and that's what everybody knows it by. Right. The problem is that before that, it's going to be called a lot of different things. And right. so how do we know we're and speaking? the Shroud of Turin once right. before, before it's there. <laughs> Not once. Right. So how do we know we're talking about the same thing? Is is the cloth um, that that is that is described in the relic inventory of 1201, is that the same thing? that is referenced in 944 that's received by the emperor there. Mm -hmm. Is it the same thing that is we're calling the image of Edessa? Is that, in fact, the same thing that St. Athanasius references in a sermon, in a homily of the 4th century, when he refers to an image of our Lord at full length that was taken to Antioch when Jerusalem fell in the year 70? Mm -hmm. So are, we to, are all of those things the same thing? And, and I have to tell you that as, a, as an academic historian, that's problematic because yeah, we how, don't. How do we even try to go about that? Because a lot of people have, I mean, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, I'm we can't. Yeah, yeah. We can't. And, and without, without vivid descriptions, without more than the testimony that we have right now, I don't think anybody can say that with certainty. And, you know. Theoretically, you can piece together a trail from Jerusalem to Antioch to Edessa to Constantinople to Lyre, France, and then to mm. Turin. I believe that. I think the environmental evidence of the pollen and soil that's shows that say, too. We do have. That's one thing where you can see. You know, you know, it doesn't tell you dates, but you can see right. roughly. But it, like, you know, or is this a fossilized pollen? Is it an older? Like, right. you know, what's the the concentration? Like that's a, a, a neat meetup of the hard sciences and, and it is. And to me, it's one way you can take the historical, the proposed historical narrative, and you can lay the scientific evidence on top of it and say, okay, yeah. this makes sense because we have an environmental journey. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But but you know, the, the pure historian. I, I mean, I, I because we rely so much on the primary written record, um, right. that's that's a challenge. And sure. um, but but I do I do obviously believe that uh, that it was around before um, sure. before it appeared in Le Ray France for sure. Somebody somebody gave it to Geoffrey de Charny. So right, where well, did he get it? You kind of related here because something that I think a lot of people don't know about, and this is something I want to pursue more. Um, so I certainly want to ask you about it. I have some uh, another guest or two I'm trying to get in touch with to, to come on specifically about this, but the art history aspect of it's intriguing yes. to me because yes. I think that's like most, I mean, I, so I was a history major undergrad before I then and went on and studied uh, theology for my master's yeah. degree. So I, and I, you know, I, I love history. I love primary sources. I love hitting the books, you know, hitting the stacks yes. and just or, yes. or finding, finding that thing that like, I look what I found, you know, but uh, you know, it's, it's, I think a lot of people think that it's just text and yeah. it's like, well, no, it's, it's, there's other stuff too. <laughs> so it, I don't, could, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about just maybe some of the, how, how art can, can play into piecing some of this together too, potentially. Yeah, I think it's very, very interesting that if you look at the earliest depictions of Jesus that we have in artwork, it's probably the catacombs of Rome is where you mm. find the earliest depictions. And during times of persecution, I've, I've obviously. Them, which is so cool yes, to be able too. to go and visit. Yeah. Yeah. And you've, so you've seen Jesus, the good shepherd, this young Roman mm -hmm. male who has short hair and classical features and yeah, toga and, or, you know, let's see how. <laughs> and, and that, that makes perfect sense during times of persecution when you're trying to, to elude Roman authorities that you would depict um, Jesus that way. But then all of a sudden in the fourth century, when Christianity is legal, the oldest image we have in that catacomb, you know, um, I think it's in the catacomb of St. Marcellinus and Peter is where you see the, the image of Christ with the Alpha and the Omega symbols next to him. Mm -hmm. And it's actually in the ceiling of one of those chapels in the, in the catacombs. And he is all of a sudden a, a Semitic male with long hair. And I would challenge people to go look at that image and look at the forehead, not mm -hmm. just the, the, the way the hair is parted, but what, what is on the forehead looks like very much like the blood stain on the shroud. Right. And so th there's, that's probably the earliest, the earliest image we have. And then of course there's the, um, 
there's the the Pantocrator icon, which mm -hmm. um, which is sixth or seventh century, I believe. That you mm -hmm. see that that again that completely. Um, well, you could almost take it and line it up with the shroud. Yeah. Um, I have and, on my door over here. Okay. <laughs> I can't hit it on the outside of it. <laughs> so it's interesting to me that, uh, that all of a sudden in the fourth century, when, when Christianity became illegal and no longer persecuted in the empire, that you begin to have these radically different images of Christ that appear. And what was the model for that? I think that's a fair question. Um, yeah. And, and if you're going, it's one thing to depict a man as Semitic. Okay. He was a Jewish man and everybody knew that he was a Jewish man. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing to include the detail of the hair parting and the plucked beard and the, the, um, the particularly that forehead imagery is interesting to me. Right. Well, so know, a lot of people don't realize, I think just your average sort of person on the street, even, you know, Christian or Catholic, you know, um, might not know or have forgotten that, you know, the gospels don't present a physical description of Jesus. Not at all. You know, like we're so not used at all. to, we're, we just take for granted the picture of Jesus in our head, but that's, you know, that doesn't, I mean, there's, there's references to the old Testament, you know, like the prophecies of, of, you know, pulling his, pulling out his beard or that you know, right. you might get a little reference here or there about a beard, but there's no, you know, right. Head, and, you know, and, and there's also, we are also informed by, by, um, you know, 1700 years of art now. Right. Uh, as to when we think of Jesus, we have an image we conjure because of 1700 years of art. But if you go back to the earliest depictions of him, then you have to ask the question, what informed that depiction? And, right. and um, you know, we know from looking at the shroud, of course, that that not only did he have that characteristic, uh, this Im this person in the shroud had this characteristic image on the forehead, but the, the parting of the hair, um, the fact that the hair was as long as it was. And, right. and it's interesting. I think people who, who have not paid much attention to the shroud uh, to look at the dorsal image and realize the man had a ponytail and he had a long ponytail <laughs> that hang, that was below his shoulder blades, you know? Yeah. And, and so like he would get some looks if he showed up at mass. Absolutely. <laughs> well, absolutely. That's, actually, that's a good, I've heard Barry Schwartz talk about that, you know, as far as, cause I know that some of, some non-Christian, or I'm sorry, some non-Catholic Christian denominations sometimes see that as proof that it's not the image of Jesus because right. they have a particular interpretation that that I, th I think is is misguided. I, I've heard some very good explanations about how that's that's a misinterpretation that you know he would not he would have had short hair. But um, yeah. uh, Barry and I've heard others very much you know point out all kinds of, of uh, aspects in the Jewish law and other just just history and, and, and culture and tradition that was. Pretty, pretty clear to me, at least, you know, at my level, you know, which is relatively low compared to them, that it was, it would have been pretty typical actually for him yeah. to have longer yeah. hair, that that's actually a sign that it's, it's it, towards authenticity. Right. Longer hair and, and the ponytail is authentically Jewish. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, um, so, so I, you know, there's that and, but the, the way that he, that he has this transformation between century one and century four is particularly fascinating to me. And, um, and we really can't explain that, you know, um, there was no one living who knew what he'd look like right. <laughs> right? Right. when this transformation occurs. So uh, that then became the model for every single depiction of him ever since, except of course, Tab Hunter in one of the Jesus of Nazareth movies. I can't remember which one, this blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus, but, but we know of course that's incorrect. The sort of Cecil and, B. DeMille glowing yes, kind of, you know. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Well, cause this, this ties into, like I've, I've seen some recent research. I'm excited to hopefully, you know, get uh, some folks on about that specifically on the coinage too, uh, yes. side of this, which is pretty cool. Really like Byzantine coins that, that seem to match and have those, those features. So yeah, there's a yeah. lot there that I, I had never heard. And also, you know, some of the, um, was it, um, I'm forgetting her name now. Is it, um, uh, MacTild Fleury, um, uh, Lemberg? Is that the right name? I'm not sure that it's done textile research that's shown. Yes. You know, you can find yes. like, the, I'm not sure that's the name, but yes. Like the, like the four holes or like, like there's, there's characteristics of the cloth that you see mm -hmm. then in depictions of, you know, so it'll be like a depiction of Jesus's burial. It's like a gospel scene and it's made in, you know, I, I think the one she was looking at was like from like the 11th century, either way, you know, hundreds of years before the purported yeah. date of, of the, um, well, there's the uh, Hungarian. Are you thinking about the Hungarian prey codex? That might be, um, I'm not sure. There's a, like, there's, there's a, like the four holes that are like an L yeah. shape that you see on the there's shroud. A, you also see exactly. That. Yeah. There's a 12th, 
12th century manuscript um, okay. that um, that has the 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 burn holes depicted, and also yes. and also Jesus is depicted with four fingers on each hand. And right, the thumb. I've always yeah. found that very interesting because unless you knew that the thumb would retract yeah. under crucifixion, there'd be no reason to depict him with only four fingers. And crucifixion so, was was long gone as you know the state yes. you know sort of uh, so yeah. the only people who would know that at that time the argument goes would be people who had seen on the shroud the way the hands are that that you do like, not okay, see the like, thumbs oh, yeah, you don't see right. either thumb that's right that's right you know, yeah yeah that's something so, and that's that's it's, one of it's the details all it's been forensically verified that that's what happens when the median nerve is severed and it, it you know retracts up and yes yeah, just fascinating it's, it really is fascinating stuff and again yeah. speaking to the complexity of the image that all of these details just like that when you just mentioned all of these details would have to be known right. by the person that right. created it yeah yeah well and, and even the characteristics and, and this you know i know this has come up on this show a lot with different guests but you know in different ways but the blood flow on the arms you know, it's very different showing that it's right because the arms were up and then they're down later and there's different blood flow. Like it's stuff that like you could not possibly, you know, like even if, if I, I did the most in-depth study of scripture, I could that level of detail can't just come from a, you know, the best knowledge of the gospel accounts of the crucifixion, which at the end of the day aren't super detailed. OK, you know? so this is a, this is an excellent point you're bringing up because, you know, um, if you if you read the Gospels and you let's say you knew nothing about the crucifixion narrative at all, the passion narrative, and you read the Gospels for the very first time, there is absolutely nothing you're going to find in there that's going to give you detail at all. Right. I mean, we okay. Not even the so we of thorns. <laughs> so we know we know that he was struck in the face. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's interesting that we have these early icons that show a swollen cheek. Mm -hmm. um, we know that he was crowned with thorns, but we don't know anything about how they did that, what they used, right. how many puncture wounds it made. Um, we, we know that uh, the Gospels tell us then that he was beaten, he was scourged. But we don't know. The, the Gospels don't tell us what weapon. Right. Um, the Gospels don't tell us that, that there's over 360 individual wounds on this body right. that align perfectly with a Roman flagrum of the first century. And we can see the intricacies of every single wound under extreme magnification and know that they're all right. exactly the same. Right. And that there right. were two men, that he was beaten by two men, one on each side and one of them was taller than the other. Yeah. Um, the Gospels don't tell us about how he was crucified. Right. Only that he was, he was crucified. Right. Only that he was uh -huh. crucified. Right. Um, which is why, you know, we don't know about that foot wound. The foot wound on the shroud points to it being either form. He could have been he could have been nailed both feet individually or one spike through both feet. Mm -hmm. It actually we, we, we don't know that. But my point is that that anybody who was reading the gospel accounts to try to recreate on a cloth an artwork that depicts it ex with such detail did not get that from the gospel narrative. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, if it is, you go to the medieval hypothesis, you know, you are centuries, centuries away from uh, readily available access to newly discovered ancient records about specific Roman crucifixion te you know, technique. Um, you know, the people didn't just, have that handy, you know, <laughs> like, right. oh, I'm just going to go down to the library and get this book out about, you know, the forensic detail on, you know, so there's been a lot of uh, archaeological, you know, sort of you know, discoveries and different historical discoveries, you know, down through the centuries to sort of fill in the picture that we have now of, of just the way that certain things were done in ancient Rome. I think we, a lot of people just assume that people six, seven, eight hundred years ago, like knew everything about the Roman Empire. No, like, no, that's actually no, a great... Not. <laughs> That's actually a great point because um, do you know how many references there are in Roman literature to crucifixions that tell us any details about how it was done? No, there are none. So, so here's, so here's what's yeah. interesting to me is that um, in a culture that was as literate and refined as the Roman empire and you don't have, and I think Suetonius mentions crucifixion. I know that I think Livy, Livy does too, probably, but um but no detail as to how it was done. 
Right. It's not until 1968 that we have the first archaeological evidence of a man who was crucified and we found a spike through his foot. Right. So, so right. what makes us think that a 13th century artist would have this kind of knowledge? It's, mm. well, it's, it's, it's baffling. It's, I forget who said once, you know, and, and I, I'm, <laughs> I was laughed because it was, it was something to the effect of, you know, when studying Latin, you know, to maybe a humility check, like if you're really getting into it and you think, you know, ancient Rome and, and they, they, I forget who it was. It said something to the effect of like Cicero's chambermaid knew more, you know, like she, she knew more Latin and more about Rome than you ever could, you know, in a thousand yes. lifetimes. Yes. There's That's just something right. about living in that, like it's, it's in your blood, it's in your bones. It's not a thing. It's your life, you know, and so it's, the, it's your so culture. The, Rome, the Romans, you know, like I, I, they know about crucifixion cause you're going to work and you see it being done as a warning you know, right outside the city gate or something, you know, and then eventually that fades away and it's just, it's not done anymore. You know, that's right. And, people don't and if you think it, about, don't know what it is. If you think about it had been, um, when this appears in history and, um, in the 1350s appears in, in, in the documented history that we have, uh, crucifixion hadn't been done for a thousand years, mm -hmm. a thousand years. Yeah. I mean, Constantine outlawed it. And so, you know, you kind of have to wonder, there's nobody around who would have known what crucifixion was. I right. mean, how it was done. Right. Um, and and certainly to to have uh, not have had access to um, to the exact weapon, the mm -hmm. the Roman flagrum, the lance that pierced the side, which, I mean, we know now the intricacy of that wound aligns right. perfectly. And so... Well, and he, yeah, even if you tried, like you knew... Let's say you did know that, but you know, that doesn't mean you would know like the proportions. And I, I've seen, you know, I mean, right. you can find it. It's easy enough to find online. They show this, they demonstrate this with a, you know, a, a authentic, like archeologically discovered Roman flagrum. Yes. And they hold it up to the body on the shroud. And it's exactly, yeah. like, it all completely perfectly lines up with the dimensions yes. of that yeah. particular instrument from that particular time. I mean, right. that's, that's my whole thing. Like if that's not, I'm not saying that that is going to make you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right. I'm saying that is evidence, though. And for people just to quit, like, oh, where's your evidence? Like, okay. <laughs> like, well, I, I, it, it, yeah, you know, it doesn't answer the central question of of how that image got there. But oh, there no, can, not at all. But, right. but there can be no question of who the image is supposed to represent. Right. And, and that's where I think we have the disconnect. Is right. that clearly it is it is it is one person of history. It is Jesus of Nazareth, right? Because it's who else would it be? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it's, it's the, the best the best. You know, I mean he's, he's the suspect that you know matches so then, the potential piece. Yeah, yeah, so then you have to make the leap from okay, well if that's who it is, then how did the image get there? Right. Um, and that's where I right. think we we're we're transecting both faith and well, and 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 reason at that point. Do you think it's fair to say, like, if and this wouldn't be possible, you know, so if it were just sort of a really good, you know, blood stain type image that we could see all these details, because that's not that's not exactly, of course, what it is. But but we do have the blood on there. But if, for example, we were just talking about a cloth that looks like it has bloody imprints on it that match Jesus's wounds. Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, I mean, if that were somehow proof or we could, we could prove that it's, it's, you know, this, uh, shroud of Jesus, you know, you could have people who would maybe just say, okay, well, great. You know, this great historical fine. Jesus was a great moral teacher. He died for what he believed in and, you know, great. But we're, that's, you know, there is this moment where we're saying, well, no, it's, <laughs> This this image, this completely yes. his the scientifically inexplicable yes. image, that yes. very well may, you know, it, it it invites the door to be open to questions about this supernatural right. stuff. That that's always right. going to be something that you know some people may get to it and be like, okay, I can't go any any further. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, I I do think, and it, I mean, it is. It, uh, it as a matter of fact, that's how I usually begin my shroud talks that I give to the general public or okay. people who don't know anything about it is I always begin by saying we're about to encounter a real philosophical challenge and, mm. and you're going to see the limits of our human capacity. And that ultimately to me is what this is, is yeah. you confront the point where you realize that every single time we answer a question about this cloth, we have a new question. 
or a new mm-hmm. set of questions. We never reach the finite point of saying this is what it is. And we won't ever. Unless we can recreate the process 100% by, and, and demonstrate, not only do it, but then demonstrate that people in the 13th century had access to right. that. We're yeah. going to be left with an open question. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and uh, we're getting close to our, our time yes. to wrap up yes, here. We so are. this might be a good, I mean, I think that's such a good point to sort of maybe start to kind of yes. just kind of close out on that. And I'm, I just decided I'm, I'm ch- originally I was going to title this the history of the shroud, but I'm going to change it to the mystery <laughs> of the shroud. The mystery of the shroud. Yeah. And maybe that's, yeah. that's, you know, so any, you know, just anything else you want to, uh, close out with here, you know, Cheryl, as far as any your recommendations for people or just, you know, like I had a colleague earlier, just basically, you know, pointing out that this isn't really their thing. And, and, you know, it might not be for people, but just, you know, why, why do you think, you know, we've already said a little bit of this, you know, it, it, it's, it's worth people looking into. Well, you know, I think it, it says enough that it is the single most studied object in the world. We know that there have been more hours of academic scrutiny brought to bear on this cloth than anything else we know to exist from every single academic discipline that I could name that is a, right. that, that, you know, that, that has, that has any inquiring focus whatsoever, the hard sciences, history, art, history, uh, imaging specialists. And yet we still do not know how the image got there. And so to have the most studied object remain a mystery, that should be enough to invite anybody in just to say, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's somebody rather famous in history who said it this way, come and see. <laughs> Just come and see. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I would say. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, thank Cheryl. you I for really, having I, I, me. It's a delight. And I'd love to have you back on sometime. You bet. Um, Anytime. <laughs> Any, and well, we can talk about relics. We can talk about yeah. whatever you'd like. But yeah, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. God bless. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Truly awesome stuff. And um, as I mentioned in the interview, I, I definitely have a couple more leads. You know, what happens is every time I um, have uh, somebody, uh, shroud expert like Dr. White or, or uh, uh, Guy Powell or Russ Brialt or um, uh, Martha May, or, you know, the, uh, uh, anyone that I've had on here uh, to talk about this topic, I, I end up meeting new friends, you know, Pam Moon. Uh, Brenda Benton overseas in the UK, and uh, and Julie Medeiros and Sheila Stevens, it, just everybody who's coming on here to uh, uh, share. Joe Marino, uh, lest I forget, man, there's so many people. I got to write this down. So uh, the Shroud of Turin, obviously something that uh, we keep going back to and investigating, and in, in, uh, uh, in addition to everything else that we're doing here on the Gracious Guest Show. So please subscribe, like this, share this far and wide. Tell your friends to uh, come on over here. I'd love to, uh, love to have you. So God bless you guys, Gracious Gang. Until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care.